Mr. Kuleba, thank you so much. We are very happy to see you in Riga. My first question, how feel minister who started his really hard work during the war, you had all these very heavy years, now you are a little bit out of politics, does it make you a little bit more free now? Well, uh, I uh, uh, very much enjoy the new freedom that I, that I have. It's the freedom to make uh, my own schedule and to decide whom I want to see and whom I do not want to see. As minister, you do not have that luxury. Someone else is always packing your schedule with, uh, with events and you have to see everyone, whether you like them or not. Uh, but uh, essentially not too much change in my life because the work of the minister is to negotiate and to advocate. I'm not negotiating anymore but I can double down on advocating Ukraine in the world and uh, this is one of the reasons why I immediately accepted the invitation to come to Riga. The second re reason is because Riga is a splendid city and it's good to be here and to be among friends. But I'm still doing what, what I was doing as the minister. I use my contact book and I use my uh, reputation and voice to advocate decisions which will bring Ukraine's victory closer. Here in Riga, what is your message? What would you like to tell people here in Riga? Well, I was invited to speak on the panel dedicated to Ukraine-NATO relations and the future of NATO. And uh, my main message was, you know, do, do not um, uh, waste time, get Ukraine on board of NATO and do not offer Ukraine any half solutions, any alternative forms of membership or association with NATO. So I think this, is, this will be uh, probably strategically the most important topic for, for months to come. If I may ask you, was it your decision to leave ministry or you would be happy to stay longer? I'm happy when I can be helpful. And throughout my uh, public career, I learned that uh, being helpful does not directly depend on holding a specific position. Um, the moment I was appointed as foreign minister, I was ready to, uh, to leave this job because this is politics. Everything has the beginning and everything has the end. I served as foreign minister for four and a half years. Um, I went through, I led through Ukrainian diplomacy through pandemic, through the beginning of the large scale invasion of Ukraine. I have nothing to be uh, sorry or ashamed about. I left the ministry with clean conscious, consciousness and uh, um, huge respect to the team I had the honor to lead. Um, so when the president invited me to his office and uh, uh, I walked out with the understanding that I, have, uh, that I have to leave, that he wants to have another foreign minister, I, I was not agitated because uh, I just accepted the fact that now I will be doing the same thing, serving my country, but as a citizen of Ukraine, using the social capital that I gained and to, throughout the, the years of my service as the minister. We recently got to know about a uh, victory plan. I would imagine that it was also your work, there is your work also there, because it I would imagine that uh, it was longer decision or not. Well, Vic, I'm not, uh, I, I, I never claim uh, credits for someone else's work. So uh, victory plan is the uh, idea and the vision of the president of Ukraine. But yes, when I was still the minister, he convened a small group of, uh, of people, circle of people, to, to discuss this, uh, his, his idea for, of the victory plan with us. And uh, I did express some thoughts and proposals to the text. Uh, it did evolve further since then, but in principle, what I saw uh, in uh, public statements pretty much matches what we discussed uh, a month and a half ago. Uh, it's always better to have a plan than not to have it. <clears throat> Everyone who knows President Zelensky 
knows uh, that he always sets the threshold very high. I understand uh, the, uh, the countries who uh, responded in a more kind of uh, emotional way to it, but it's a beginning of a very important conversation. You have met a lot of foreign uh, ministers from all European countries, United States. You've been sitting at the same table with people who decide give uh, weapons to Ukraine or not. How would you explain why East, uh, Western uh, countries are still hesitating, not letting you use, for example, long-range weapons to target military objects in Russia? Why? How, how do you see why we are hesitating? Because they are afraid of the consequences of uh, Ukraine's victory against Russia. Uh, it's as it was the case in 1990 and 1991 when the West was uh, absolutely terrified about the potential consequences of the breakup of the Soviet Union. They are equally, uh, they equally fail today to calculate what the loss of Russia in this war will mean for Russia and what kind of consequences it will bring. I know that I'm saying something that is not laying on the surface. There is very little real debate uh, about it. But uh, from the conversations I've had, what my counterparts were always either extremely cautious or even afraid to talk about is the prospect of Russia losing the war. Even those who say Ukraine must win the war, they imagine what Ukrainian victory could potentially look like. But they find it very difficult to imagine what uh, the Russian loss will look like. And I was always telling them that, listen, if Russia wins, it will be the end, it will mean the end of the Russian Empire. If Ukraine wins, it will be the end of the Russian Empire. Not the end of Russia, but the end of Russian Empire. If Russia wins, it will be the end of the Ukrainian statehood and the beginning of the end of the European Union as the place of prosperity and security. Because Putin will, until his, uh, his last breath, he will not let Europe live in peace and prosperity. He will shatter it, he will attack it, he will continue to, to undermine it. So this is what is at stake. And those who are making the decisions, they should not be afraid of ending the Russian imperial project. Because whatever happens after that will mean less threat to Europe than Russia as empire, which is the case now. At the moment, this day we are sitting here in Riga, how optimistic are you that Ukraine will win this war? Dwight Eisenhower, the commander of the Allied forces in Europe during Second World War and then US president, once said, pessimists do not win wars. And uh, I have adopted it as, my, as, uh, as uh, one of my principles since the beginning of the large-scale invasion. And uh, yes, I'm optimist. I'm, I'm a rational person, but uh, at least I hope I am. But, uh, but I'm an optimist, because if you do not believe in victory, it's not worth fighting. The real question, the most difficult one, and no single interview can find an answer to that is what the word victory means and what will the people of Ukraine accept as, as victory. This is the conversation that we are uh, not having <coughs> for obvious reasons and uh, every person first and foremost in Ukraine in my view must ask him or herself this question what does victory mean for me? And once the society finds the answer to this question, or at least options for answers, then a broader conversation can take place. I believe in Ukraine's victory. 
I believe that we have already won by surviving because this is the first time in Ukrainian history when uh, the Ukrainian state did not cease to exist under the Russian attack. All the times, centuries ago, every time Russia attacked Ukraine militarily resulted in the death of the state, of the Ukrainian statehood. Today, we are already strong enough to defend our statehood, the existence of our state, which I believe is a big historic victory. And the question now is how far we can take it. What else can we win? Mr. Kuliba, thank you so much. Thank you.